Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, see so we've got a number of uh, attendees, which is fantastic to see. Uh, must not have a lot to do outside these days in the era of uh, the coronavirus. Uh, my name is Jonathan Neal. I'm the director of the Center for Business and Management of the Arts. And very shortly, I expect us to be joined here by Laura Hyatt uh, to talk a little bit about what is going on uh, in, in her life, in her leadership, in her organization. Um, and we'll see when she, uh, she pops on here any moment. Um, until then, bear with us uh, and uh, we'll get things going very shortly. And I believe I am welcomed here by Laura Hyatt. There she is. Hi. How are you? It's great to see you. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah. We've got a, a number of people on the line with us today. I'm going to keep most people muted while we have our conversation. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask, we'll make some time for that towards the end. I request that everybody put that into the chat window. Uh, most of you have probably become experts at Zoom in the last 72 hours, I imagine, or some other platform. So. Um, throw it up into the chat window. I will take a look at them as we get later on into this conversation and uh, um, and uh, we will take it from there. Laura, it's great to see you. I haven't Thanks. seen you in a, in a few weeks. Uh, you're looking you're looking well as well as uh, one can as show up on these web cameras. Yeah, you too. Trying. <laughs> um, thank you for doing this. Uh, yeah. As as I'm sure most of the the people who are on our call know, uh, Laura is the executive director of Los Angeles Nomadic Division, uh, which is a uh, arts organization dedicated to site specific public art projects in Los Angeles um, and around the country uh, and and beyond. Um, and so I think is someone who probably has a, a unique take on what has happened in the last week uh, or to two weeks as we have all gradually had our um, lives uh, reduced to the, to the virtual world. Um, and so I'm very pleased that Laura is, is joining us uh, for the first of these conversations uh, to create some community, to have a conversation about what's happening in arts in Los Angeles um, and how it's affecting our leaders and our and our organization. So, Laura, many thank you, uh, many thanks for for joining us yeah. today, yeah. Um, and and putting off your lunch or either having it early or a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty soon we'll all be sitting here eating, you know, uh, ramen, ramen noodle soup uh, uh, as yeah. we have these conversations. Yeah. Um, well, good. So, I mean, first off, uh, how are you doing? How are, how have you been handling the uh, the safer at home? uh restrictions the lockdown i've heard it called the uh the jail sentence the <laughs> social distancing uh whatever it is that you may want to describe this thing as um how are you doing yeah it's such a weird question right like i i i don't even know how to answer that these days like there's no kind of normal response we i started quarantining coming up on two weeks ago like that first week when we were all kind of thinking that it was on the horizon, but not sure. Um, you know, we're fortunate with the structure of land that we generally have one team day in the office where we're all together on Tuesdays. Um, and then the rest of the week we're working remotely. So we have that flexibility, flexibility built into the structure of the organization. Um, so coming up on two weeks of like essentially being at home is, it's kind of a mind trip, you know, you're, it's, it's bizarre. And we had a big program that we'd been working towards that first weekend. Um, we've been programming this space downtown. There's a 25,000 square foot raw space that we had just started programming out. And the very first program that we were going to do in that space where we had invited in another organization, um, a newer, also kind of public art organization called Active Cultures, which is at the intersection of art and food. And they had a huge program planned that was, I think, what, March 15th, whatever that Saturday was, the 14th or 15th. Right. Um, and we were all just kind of gearing up for that. And it, we had to make a kind of last minute decision in terms of the safety of that. So ultimately um, they canceled that program and that just kind of set off the whole kind of train of cancellations and postponements. We had, I think, eight programs over the next two months that were now pivoting and figuring out 
whether they should happen virtually, whether they should be postponed. Um, so it's prompting a lot of larger conversations, obviously, around engagement and programming and the yeah. of everything. Right yeah, I think the, it seems like the uncertainty is certainly one of the yeah. one of the key issues that everybody's trying to contend with. Uh, we know we know I think for certain that whatever you had planned for the next two weeks is going to remain online and in restriction. But the the longer the time horizon stretches out, the less and less we have any kind of uh, of knowledge about what it's going what's going to be happening and uh, and how various different programs are also going to be affected. I mean, I'm sort of curious, so for, for land, um, I imagine you've been having a number of conversations with, with, your, with your team and, and with your board and with other people. What, you know, are there any sort of longer term conversations that have been going on about how this transforms what it is that land does and the kinds of projects that it might be able to take on given the new environment? Yeah, it certainly inspires a number of conversations around what how we think about public art in a time that is inherently private um but then i think it's it's an interesting exercise to kind of yeah project that further afield and think of um it, it's forcing me to kind of contend with just thinking about our audiences really in a really deep way and you know the idea i think in art spaces institutions whether or not you have one space or you know, land if we are diffused and nomadic by nature, um, thinking of who engages with your projects and how they engage and just kind of reassessing, I think, how we can take for granted the like built in audiences to our projects and how we can really kind of fundamentally change the nature of how we do what we do, how we communicate what we do, um, all of the kind of aspects of the digital storytelling and narrative around both like leading up to a project and then once a project is occurring and then after a project or an exhibition, I kind of use those terms um, sure. interchangeably. Um, it's, I think it's important for us to really take a moment and think about why we're doing what we're doing and how we, how we convey why we're doing that too. Um, and not kind of continue to operate in these silos institutionally um, and how we can really collaborate and communicate across our field, but also more expansively, you know, outside of just arts audiences and arts institutions, but certainly as a public art organization, um, you know, I keep coming back to like our, who we serve and ultimately we are as a nonprofit in the service of artists and the communities that make up our city. Um, we've done projects around the country, but since I started last July, my focus is really on projects and programming in Los Angeles with predominantly LA-based artists. Um, so it's, you know, you have to kind of take a step back and look at it from a bigger picture. This isn't really necessarily about lands projects and sure how we pivot, but it's like how, what do our communities and predominantly artists, what do they need right now? And how can we help provide that, share those resources, um, and what that can really look like digitally, virtually, remotely, all the ways. Sure. I was going to ask. Yeah, I was going to ask if you had some sort of more specific examples that you've been been either discussing or um, uh, maybe having to do with some of the more recent projects or some of the ones that have been upcoming about how those things are pivoting and and yeah. and how they are redefining some of those ways of thinking about your community and some of the ways of redefining the the public aspect of uh, of the public art mission of land yeah so land has always functioned on these kind of three tiers of program longer term projects that are kind of open-ended that might be um like a thematic exhibition with a group of artists where we don't have we don't have a predetermined location or there is a location that we're interested in but we don't really know the format that the exhibition will ultimately take and so you just kind of follow the breadcrumbs and over time build you know the build the team, build your resources, and figure out what that looks like. And so we're working on a couple of those. That's my next meeting after this is an exhibition that really the idea for it happened five years ago. It's a project called Future Continuous. Um, and it was a project when I was at Land many years ago, thinking about, it just kind of stemmed from this thinking that Blade Runner, the movie was set in Los Angeles in November, 2019. And so this was five years ago. So we're like, wow, we're gonna be living in the future. What is LA gonna look like? How, you know, does it contrast against what we thought it would look like 30 years ago or whatever? Um, 
And so that- Unfortunately, very much the same. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's in and of itself. And that project has really been developed in and around the Bradbury building um, as this kind of really unique site in Los Angeles that exists that so many people don't know about, don't visit, but that is technically publicly accessible and just captures so much of the imagination for so many artists that are interested in responding to it. Um, so that's been a really interesting project to kind of chase down, if you will, and figure out what its kind of evolving format can look like in the time frame with our partners that exist in the Bradbury building. Um, so we'll see how we want to kind of pivot or, you know, just postpone. Um, we had two other, sorry, so that's the kind of first tier and there's not really a hierarchy. It's just a way for us to kind of develop sure. and plan in the immediate and then longer term. Um, the second tier are these projects that do have a kind of a defined site, a defined time frame, a defined artist or group of artists. So an example of that is we were invited, um, I was previously at the Hammer Museum for about three years and when I left to return to land, um, Annie Philbin said, you know, if ever, I, Annie and I had a conversation, we said if ever there was a project for land to collaborate with Hammer on, we collaborated in the past on a Richard R. Chuaga, uh exhibition, um, you know, let me know. And within a week, they had called and said, one of the artists that's participating in Made in LA 2020 this summer wants to do a citywide project. Land has done a number of these citywide projects. So, you know, I asked them for more information and we were brought on to co-present a citywide presentation of Black News with the artist Khalil Joseph um, with the, the goal of installing the work at 50 sites and mostly South LA, but it's really about just kind of having a diverse mix of sites where people can engage with Black News, this two-channel, continuously updating and evolving video work um, in their kind of everyday spaces. So this month was a really pivotal month when we were doing a lot of, we had identified the sites over the fall and the winter, and this was the month that we were really reaching out to all of these sites, you know, hospitals, coffee shops, LAX, um, just barber shops and beauty shops, all these kinds of sites to get them on board with installing the work over the summer. And so that's obviously just kind of come to a halt. So that's one of the biggest projects that we're pivoting and figuring out right now how that can look like. The Hammer just made the decision yesterday to postpone the opening of Made in LA to, I think it's July 19th, and that'll be on yep. through the end of December. So they're they built in some flexibility in case July isn't even, doesn't prove to be feasible, they can push it to the fall. So now, I mean, just having had that conversation yesterday, we're figuring out what that looks like for the kind of timeline in terms of installing and getting the sites committed and how we can also support all of these small businesses around the city that are gonna be really struggling the next few months. Um, you know, land is just such a like uniquely situated organization in terms of how collaborative we inherently have to be with all of these non-arts institutions. Um, so that's the kind of second tier, an example of that. And then the third tier are more immediate and kind of responsive programmatic elements. We have two programming series, Frame Rate and Nomadic Nights. Frame Rate is a screening series. Nomadic Nights are more performative and we get funding through the LA City Department of Cultural Affairs, the DCA, um, to do those programs and in specific city council districts throughout the city. and we just got an email from them, I think at the end of last week, that said that they were open to these, anything that was funded through the DCA to now be presented virtually. And so that has really forced us to kind of think, rethink how we present those works um, and most likely moving them to be presented digitally. Um, yeah. That's a lot. That's an, that's a, that's an amazing amount. Um, I was, I wanted to, you know, I was struck when you were talking about the inherently collaborative nature of land and particularly the Black News Project with El, Made in LA and Khalil Joseph. So what, what has your been, ex, has, has been your experience, if you've had it yet, of communication with, with some of these other non-arts organizations, businesses, um, and initiatives uh, of how they are being impacted and, and what has been your kind of approach? Because, uh, you know, these, these, these are sometimes relatively collateral activities in terms of what, you know, obviously a hospital or a barbershop or a, a restaurant might be involved in. Um, and so I know it's not the first thing that you want to lead with I means say, hey, we still want to do this art project. Um, 
but uh, so I'm sort of curious what what those conversations have looked like and and what um, some of the ideas that either land has had or some of the community members have had in terms of how these how these things can continue um, but with a with other gestures of support and resiliency and uh, and creating a kind of robust landscape so that we're not just dealing with kind of fallout from the from the economic crisis of this on, on a daily basis. That's what we're trying to figure out. That's the question. I think last week it was just all too new and happening. Right. Everything was happening so rapidly. So we were trying to kind of have these conversations, but I, it just wasn't realistic to be having them in that moment. Nobody has any idea what, what the kind of real time frame this is going to look like right now. So it just didn't feel feasible to really. So we kind of put our outreach on hold last week, sure. regrouped with the hammer yesterday. And now that we have this uh, confirmed, you know, extended time frame, we'll kind of start the process of re-engaging with those companies. But I, I just, you know, I think it's also like being realistic that, you know, these are people's livelihoods and certainly a public art project. You know, we want to kind of continue to inspire people and support the artists that we're committed to, but it's just not realistic. Like that's just not a priority in this sure. minute. That's how I sure. think it is. <laughs> No, I mean, I think that I think that's a, I think it's an absolutely reasonable response. Um, it's uh, and it and it and it, it, it's, it there's a sort of strange temporality. I really appreciated how you divide your projects on the temporal order rather than sort of the geographic or the budgetary. Yeah. Um, and I've been having this conversation with a number of other people. If there's one thing that seems germane to or or, or indicative of this moment that we're in, it's this kind of altered temporality, right? That that the the time the are the experience or the phenomenology of our of our uh, experience of time is so um, distended at the moment, right? I mean, this idea that the, the, the you know the safer in place the order happened on I think Thursday, right? Like safe at home happened just last Thursday, and I and you know and other organizations like our university had been in the process of sort of gradually making plans to shut down and to begin to think about how to move operations into the virtual landscape. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that seems like a month ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, these things have been happening so quickly and yet they already seem so far away. And it, it, part of that was also because we've all seen, I mean, in a bizarre way, kind of have adjusted to this new reality so quickly. Um, which is mm -hmm. the other kind of odd thing too. Are you finding resistance on your end? What I'm, the conversations that I'm having, you know, we're like a, a small, nimble nonprofit or organization. We can pivot pretty easily in terms of moving things digitally, having the team work remotely. But I'm curious, and I, I, I feel like there's some larger resistance. And I think what people are really gonna have to contend with on a kind of larger scale is that just this new reality of like that we can and there is a lot that we still can do virtually. Um, will the larger institutions be as receptive to those pivots or are they gonna just kind of, you know, keep it differentiated in a way? It's a really, it's a really interesting question. Um, and, in, and in that you could almost, you could take land and your organization as a, as a management model for an arts organization, as one that's able to do large scale projects has relied on uh, a, a kind of digital uh, infrastructure to present works, to record them, to program them, because these things are outside of a, you know, the, 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 the actual architecture of, a, of, a, of an institution, yeah. of a physical space. Yeah. Um, and so I've kind of been navigating these waters for a long time. And so probably have a lot of lessons to teach the big institutions about how to pivot into this, right? And then my question is, and this is sort of the prospective version is sort of what happens afterwards, right? Does, does, does everybody snap back to what they knew beforehand because that's what had been built and practiced for uh, years and decades in some of these institutions, yeah. or is this fundamentally transformative, right? Well, and maybe that has to do yeah. with scale. That was kind of my question to you um, with the larger institutions and schools, I guess, that to say, you know, seeing how it's not impossible to keep things moving in the ways in which we work. Obviously, there are so many industries where it's never going to be possible, but for 
museums, for universities, certain companies where it's not that hard to kind of continue doing the work in these ways. Yeah, will they be receptive to kind of continue or will it be just this kind of reversal to still operating, you know, physically in the same way? Yeah. Personally, I, I don't, I think that there has to be some kind of longer, larger shifts that happen. It's just not sustainable in all of the ways. And I was really feeling that in speaking with colleagues kind of coming out of freeze in that moment and just all of the kind of the months and weeks leading up to that and the kind of larger schedule of the art world and how like inherently on all levels unsustainable that is and this is bringing out the precarity of that and so i think that we're going to have to see some some larger longer term like yeah. fundamental shifts in how we all yeah. work and operate and thinking of the sustainability of the industry and of all of our in organizations and how they all relate to one another yeah i agree with that um i mean i think there's I think there's great opportunity in a way here uh, for uh, people in our industry and even outside of the industry, because there are all these challenges right now. There's all these difficulties. There are all these kinds of unknowns, but um, all of that is a kind of chance to say, all right, well, what, what can we do to respond? How can we build something that will be effective currently uh, in, the, in, the, in the given scenario and then will continue to be effective um, going forward and some of For that will just be the unknowns. A, I mean there's just right. going to continue to be this is one completely you know something we were completely unprepared for but there's just going to be more and more of these whether it's you know ecological in all the ways so how sure. do we kind of yeah sure. plan, for the, plan for the unplannable in a way right right um yeah, yeah I mean there's like in, in this in the in the landscape of projecting natural disasters you know, this is like someone to compare it to like a really slow moving hurricane. Um, and but but yet it's a it's a hurricane that doesn't affect any of the information technology. Right. So, you know, the, the difference, the, like the real the real, you know, it's like you can think about what would be the opposite scenario in which everybody was really encouraged to be out of their homes in communities, you know, meeting together you know, being outside, you know, sharing meals, sharing activities, you know, this kind of like- a large scale technological failure or something. Right, right, if yeah. you know, yeah. exactly. It's like yeah. if, there was a, if there's a kind of major earthquake and, yeah. you know, and, and all of yeah. a sudden it's like you're, you don't have, you know, Zoom is not the way that everybody yeah. is communing and you can't sort of get access to these things and that's really, really forces everyone to, to join up. Um, although, you know, again, I, 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 we will see, this is, this is sort of, I don't know, day two of our university going to fully online instruction um, which I know is is traumatic both for faculty and for students and for administrators and for everybody else. Um, but I think everybody's so far been making the best of it, and yeah. uh, the, you know this is one of the reasons why we've been having these kinds of these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Um, have you come across any novel or innovative things that you've seen other other arts organizations or artists or or, or people that are doing? I just I just came across a notification from Untitled, the group that runs the art fair up in San Francisco that is creating yeah. a fund for artists in the Bay Area to, yeah. um, to send out uh, checks for $250 to support people. And so they're just basically taking open calls from artists in the neighborhood um, to, to basically get them some of, the, some of the cash that they would otherwise be making in the various different contingent jobs that they do, which I think is a great. Have you, have you come across some other things like this or other things yeah. that arts organizations have been doing? I'm really heartened by the conversations that are being had across organizations and also just individuals. I'm having a lot of great conversations with our donors, with our board. We had to postpone, we were working on a big 10th anniversary kind of benefit dinner and moment um, in May that we've just put on hold at this point. Um, and so we were looking to raise at least $100,000 for our exhibitions this year. So it's like, okay, well, how do we pivot that and is this even an appropriate moment to be fundraising for these exhibitions or what is how can we you know allocate our resources the resources that we do have or galvanize resources where they are most needed and so I'm talking to a lot of like foundations and grants that we have relationships with about how that might look in terms of providing direct support for artists locally um, because you are seeing it happen in New York I feel like yeah nada it's interesting how like nada and untitled I feel like have been two of the most kind of vocal in terms of wanting to really galvanize support for their local artist communities. 
in a way that I've not seen it as much with the larger art fairs, you know, I guess understandably who are having to pivot in a really large scale. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think to be quite candid, like that last week of just hearing from every possible company and institution and organization, it just got tiring. And it's like, you know, <laughs> I don't need to see another email about how you're responding to COVID-19. Um, what I'm interested in is again, kind of, yeah, thinking on a more like fundamental shift level is like, what can this programming look like? And, you know, the response of like, I don't want to go to a museum virtually. Like, I, you know, I don't think it's realistic that that's, you know, museums can exist only virtually or that, you know, the idea of just translating whatever you had into something digital, you have to totally think about reformatting the content itself and how it, how people are going to engage and respond to it. Um, so I don't think that the solution is just like, here's our collections online, you know, like who even has the like mental bandwidth right now to like think critically about these things, right. I don't know, you know? Right. So I, no, I, I, I 100% agree. I 100% <laughs> agree with that. I mean, it's great that everyone's doing that and they're bringing them out from behind various different paywalls and membership walls and yeah. all these kinds of things. But it, it, it does feel like this immense sort of bandwidth dump that is yeah. now putting it on the part of the consumer with yeah. zero capacity to navigate any of it. And it's, and I think the important thing here is like, without any kind of story, right? Like without the, uh, without any of the, um, the uh, putting, putting it into kind of some sort of narrative form that can create um, a, a kind of community of sense around um, a specific body of objects or an experience or something like that. And, and we realize that, you know, exhibitions do that sort of internally, right? They sort of structure their own narratives. But the, the sheer fact of going to a museum or going to a performance of some sort um, is, is itself a kind of narrative, right, for people, right? It's like you, you made the choice to go, you meet up with friends, there's what happens before, there's what happens afterwards. And so there's like, there's an entire sort of arc of activities that, well, that turns that into a narrative. Right, the element right. of ritual that is so grounding and keeps us connected interpersonally and kind of collectively. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that's the thing that I think that a lot of the institutions are gonna have to uh, wrap their heads around a little bit more is, is uh, one, sort of reintroducing some of that ritual, obviously in the last five days, the one that has seemed to sort of taken over with most people is like drinks at, you know, <laughs> it started at 6 p.m. and then it became 5 p.m. and then it's like 4 p.m. and pretty soon, you know, the, the, the like virtual happy hours are basically now sort of like 24 hour deals. Like, yeah. you know, somewhere, somewhere right now there are people drinking on Zoom and you can yeah. join them. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, th that will get pretty old pretty fast. Um, yeah. And the, but then the, I think the other thing that people contend with, and then you hear this too, it's like, oh, there's all this time for people to read or to, to consume other areas of culture the that they weren't able to consume. Or, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that those are, those are the examples that a lot of the institutions will need to look to, not in ex as a translation of their, um, programming, but as something that, again, they're doing sort of in addition to their programming that needs to be compelling, right? There needs to be something that's not just, let me take a tour of this exhibition and let you know what it is, or let me tell the story. It's like, you should be making short, you know, fictional videos, right? Short, short uh, scripted narratives that you can put alongside these things. That and get, education, a lot of like, yeah, educational content. Gain an audience. Families and kids too, like that's, the, that, I can't even imagine people with the oh my God! Being a single person, but people with children <laughs> all this, and having to maintain jobs and careers, as well as like now being teachers, homeschool teachers. I can't there remember. was there's the the video of this uh, Israeli woman who sort of went off on her Instagram story uh, that actually then made it into the New York Times the next day, which was kind of amazing. Basically talking about how. You know, she's being bombarded by uh, the schools for her three children about, you know, doing this and doing that and music lessons and math and all these kinds of things. And she's like, enough already, right? Like, this will be over. Give them a break. Give me a break. Um, you know, that uh, 
that's a whole different, I get, you know, we are, we are trying to manage the amount of time that we're spending in front of the screens and that children are spending in front of the screens. And now it's almost like that's out the window and you sort of stick them onto the computer. And now, you know, in there, they will be, they'll be looking at the screens for four hours. And then that's, that's where things are going to change afterwards. I don't yeah. even know what's going to happen after that. <laughs> how do you go back from that? Yeah. How, yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you dial back from that? Right. Like post Corona, my daughter's going to have like withdrawal from not being able to be on her various different web pages and things like that. Um, so, you know, is has there, has there been anything else that you've been able to consume or anything else that you've been engaging in that's like, that, uh, you yeah. know, has been intellectually interesting. Tell me what, what, if, what are some of the new habits or the new things that you've been looking at? Um, yeah, well, I guess to kind of go back to what I was saying at the beginning, I'm taking this as a moment to kind of pause and reflect on why we do what we do and to try and evaluate how effectively we're communicating that with the public. And I realized, you know, organizations and institutions who have all of these kind of large communications team and have everything so polished about how they communicate their upcoming exhibitions and the schedules in which, you know, the social media schedules and calendars and it's all, I think that all goes out the window right now. And I think I know what I'm personally craving is just like real conversations with people that I know, people that I don't know, just like seeing some sense of normalcy in other people's faces and having conversations is what I'm finding to be the most comforting right now, whether it is these like Zoom happy hours or like FaceTimes with friends and family. Um, and so just reflecting on, yeah, what I'm kind of seeking out the most in my own life in terms of land, it's like, you know, we have an opportunity that we wouldn't have thought about or taken the time to do to share who our team is. You know, we have a pretty small, but, um, diffused kind of team of about 10 to 12 different people that are working on different projects. So rather than, you know, taking this time, like, because our whole programming calendar and communications calendar just goes out the window, it's like, let's talk about what we're doing through the different team members. So taking this time to kind of highlight the team, what they're working on and how they're kind of staying sane and inspired right now. So using communicating across kind of social media that we're going to start we've been working kind of trying to compile as many of the like physical um tangible resources that exist right now in terms of direct support job opportunities whatever that might look like for artists um we're gonna we're trying we're working really quickly to try and compile all of that information um and sh get that out as much as possible whenever artists send us information about you know like in the last few days it's been how the hospitals locally need more masks and supplies and that that's something that a lot of artists might have sitting around in their studios that aren't being used right now so a number right. of artists were putting out calls and saying you know i'm going to go around and gather these supplies so you know helping to kind of spread the word on that front um and just really like yeah have it kind of be personal and not moving away from the like institutional brand identity and voice that just feels so inauthentic right now to really highlighting like the individuals that make up the organization and how they're doing what we're doing and how we're staying committed to the projects that we you know were committed to and the artists that we were committed to and what that's going to look like and just being really honest with with our audiences across the different platforms um personally it's it's a weird it's weird as the time goes on and on at first i was like this is amazing like i have a stack of 20 books on you know for research for upcoming exhibitions that i like realistically was probably not going to ever have time to complete and so certainly in like chipping away at all of those books and like really diving into the you know kind of curatorial research for upcoming exhibitions in a way that i probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to which is which was really great at first but again to be frank like i'm just finding i don't have a lot of like mental capacity like i have a very limited window of like critical thinking these days and yeah just trying to like balance you know as i think we all are just how much information we consume and from where um i don't know it's getting weird i think it's getting weird <laughs> you think we're hitting it's like the the you know the 72 90 you know yeah. 97 hour uh window where all of a sudden the, some of the cracks begin to uh emerge and things start getting a little weirder <laughs> we're for sure gonna start getting weirder and weirder which is not necessarily a bad thing but just trying to like yeah not you know it's 
I would imagine maybe it's somewhat similar to like raising a child where it's like one day something works, but that's not going to work the next day. Like things are changing so quickly that you can't say, okay, this is working and I'm going to make a plan and execute things according to this kind of schedule. Like that all just goes out the window and it's just kind of day by day of figuring it out. But certainly, I'm, again, I'm really heartened by just the kind of openness and receptiveness across the nonprofit space, a lot of like in constant communication with all of my kind of co other directors um, around town and how we're all just kind of being really open and honest and communicative about how we're getting through this. And that sure. doesn't necessarily mean the most, you know, like sure. logical, professional, but it's like by all means necessary right now, like whatever it's gonna take to just get through this and hopefully come out more um, yeah, more receptive to the unplanned and uncertainty of it all. Hopefully, you know, it's certainly highlighting, again, the kind of precarity and fragility of the nonprofit sector and how interconnected we are with these larger economic forces. And so trying to come up with, we had already in thinking of this kind of 10 year benefit moment, I had already been interested in moving away from like a standard annual gala benefit model. And in all the work that I've done, for the last 10 years in nonprofits is trying to move away from kind of transactional philanthropy, which I think there's a lot moving in that towards that direction. And so we'd already been wanting to, yeah, kind of move away from selling tickets and more towards appeals to donations to support our programs. And so that forces you as an organization to really think about how you communicate what you do and the narratives around it. So we'd already been doing that work, but certainly this is going to kind of highlight that and force us to really double down. You know, if we can't fundraise and sell tickets for one isolated event. It's how you engage your donor base in a kind of ongoing way and really convey the significance and again, why you do what you do. I think we all have to like kind of answer that for ourselves and our respective work to stay motivated right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I, the, the, the question about how arts organizations, nonprofits in particular, uh, maintain <laughs> Um, sort of their their institutional infrastructure and maintain their donor bases is a is a new one because you know the most the most recent sort of crisis that nonprofits faced was in the wake of two thousand and eight yeah. and given Which that that happened so like I started as a development director coming like right in that moment right right into that moment yeah. and so and and you know we're talking about a you know a twelve ten to twelve year time period here so. You've got a moment. You've got a moment that really hit the nonprofit world differently. I remember at the time I was in New York and I was working um, with the Drawing Center part time, and a very august, uh, excellent, uh, small arts organization in Soho. Um, at the time, being run by Brett Lippman, uh, Claire Gilman had just come on as the as the curator, um, and the. Uh, the, the financial crisis really hit the boards of those organizations because that was really where a lot of the money was coming from. And as long as the markets were doing well and the people's finances were doing well, um, that, that was a real challenge. And so you had that problem. It had precipitated also the, um, the, the revelations and the collapse of Madoff advising empire. And so there were also all these people on these institutional boards that thought they had millions of dollars to give and realize that they didn't have anything and that they were going to be moving out of their homes very soon and having to, you know, sell assets in order to just get by. And that almost hit these organizations even harder. I'm happy, you know, the, as much as the markets have been uh, in total turmoil in the last, uh, you know, two, uh, two weeks to a month, it's, it's not, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like <laughs> it doesn't feel like that's where it doesn't feel like that's where the, the the problems are right like those that capacity for support is still out there yeah um it where, where it's hitting is, is the workers right i mean it's like these organizations are shut down and so so all the people that work for these places can't go to work if they're hourly they're not gaining their paychecks and that's really all of a sudden where the crisis is hitting and the question is whether the donors and the communities are able to step up to support that, whether everybody expects it to be a sort of national or a state bailout. I mean, whether there are going to be no interest loans, you know, what are the various different debt facilities that are going to be created in order to support this stuff? 
it, 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 in, in my mind, it's a very, it, it's hitting a very different group of individuals and it's hitting the organization differently. And, and, it's a, and, it, and so looking at that in terms of how do we sustain, how do you support these organizations is now very different because what is it that, that the philanthropists and the donors have always been reluctant to, to pay for? It's operations, yeah. right? And this is a crisis of operations, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not a crisis bottom, of content. Bottom up versus like top down, yeah. Right, right. It's not a crisis of content. It's not a crisis yeah. of curating. It's not a crisis yeah. of like the special projects, everything else. I mean, it is that, but it's the foundations of these organizations have really been the ones that are, are facing the greatest uncertainty. And then the people who make up the foundations of those organizations are the ones facing the greatest uncertainty. Um, and and it, like that's where it's great to see places like Untitled and Nada and others like, yeah. try and figure out how to, how to do the support. Um, but I think that's the area that I'm going to be interested to watch very closely when it comes to how, how these, um, you know, many of these, the big donors and the big supporters are able to step in because, you know, yeah, their portfolios might be down because of the, of the crunch, but you know, everyone's still sitting on decent, decent amounts of money and you realize where that stuff needs to go. I really appreciate someone like Darren Walker, who's really stepping up and being really vocal right now, that it is the responsibility of people that are stewarding these large foundations to kind of come together and loosen grant restrictions. You know, there are so many different ways that this can look. This isn't necessarily about writing a check, but if you've already written a check, you know, maybe, yeah, it's loosening up any kind of restrictions around how those funds need to be used. Right, um, right. Just providing anything that you're looking at committing to that then transfers to becoming um, general operating support or whatever. But I think it really will fall onto these kind of larger individuals that have a platform like the Ford Foundation to kind of set a precedence for other right. individuals to kind of follow. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, I so think that's I, right. I feel, optimistic. I, feel, I feel hopeful and optimistic, but maybe that is because I'm, you know, we're somewhat, I guess, I would say fortunate, but it was intentional and land being formed like in 2008, you know, we, we intentionally created an organizational structure that was really nimble with really low overhead um, that could kind of try hopefully withstand some of these fluctuations in a way that a larger, more traditional institution wouldn't be able to. So I'm grateful that, you know, that was kind of implemented in the core of the organization from a really early, you know, the benefit of being formed at such a trying time has allowed us to be, yeah, more nimble and responsive in that way. Yeah, and, uh, and, I, and I think that we'll, we'll sort of look to what the decisions that you are making and that the, and that the organization and, and its leadership is making with regard to fundraising and communications and, and engagement um, as, a, as a model for how to do this uh, for organizations, even at different scales. Right. Yeah. Or even with operations. And this is the other thing, even operations inside of larger organizations, right, yeah. that could be restructured to be a little bit more flexible, resilient, anti-fragile, um, yeah. so that you know that it, when these things happen, you've got operations that, uh, that can continue uh, largely kind of un, uh, unimpeded um, and are able to sort of switch and do what they need to do. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna remind everybody that that uh, we uh, will take questions in the chat window if you've got them, um, and uh, I'm gonna ask one more big philosophical question, and then uh, we'll move to see what 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 some of our uh, listeners have to have to say. Um, how how do you think that this redefines or reconceptualizes a public, right? What this is you know, so much of it. This is a it's a public health crisis. It is a, um, uh, you know, the, the public uh, in various different uh, regions of the country has been told to, uh, you know, stay indoors, stay six feet away from one another. You know, what is the, in your mind, sort of like, what are some of the other ways that, the, that this, this notion of the public is being stretched, strange, challenged, um, redefined? Uh, and, I, and I'm asking that obviously because land is, is, a, is an arts organization, which is, which has a very specific uh, attitude towards or approach towards uh, uh, the public. Yeah, it's the same. I, I'm, I think just kind of doubling down, I think first of all, it's a total re reconfiguration of what the public means. And um, in the same way that we approach all of our projects with 
foregrounded in the element of site specificity, it's approaching our audiences and the public in the exact same way, which is that we can't, again, make these assumptions that maybe in the art world we did for a long time or took for granted. And this idea of the public as being this kind of monolith, but that you really have to get much more kind of granular about it. And, and I think speak to people, think of publics and a much kind of smaller, more localized scale and realizing how interconnected all of the different audiences are, but that, yeah, just not taking for granted this idea of like a kind of generalized public and really thinking about like kind of individually how you're conveying what you do, why you do what you do and how you do it. Um, and just thinking on a much smaller, more immediate and direct scale. Yeah, and, and almost, I, I mean, I, I like what you said there and almost as a way that 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 publics are created right the public is the public is a is an emergent phenomenon in various different scenarios it's not just an abstract entity that exists out there yeah, exactly. um and that you know that it's that what you are doing and the way that you are engaged with one another is is productive of a kind of public and maybe there are stronger or weaker versions of that um and maybe there's a there might be a politics to it or a sort of an ethics to it as well in terms of um what kind of empowerment you make possible um what kind of uh what kind of kind of uh, liberties are are taken or given within those within those publics that they end up getting defined um yeah. which which i think is you know is again it, it, for a lot of a lot of public art organizations so much the public ends up being this kind of background condition in a way, right? It's yeah. sort of like that's the that's the either the canvas or the the ground against which is is presented um, some uh, activity uh, uh, activation project, what have you. Um, and maybe that's maybe that's a, a, a less productive way of of thinking about it. Totally. Like, like, what does that actually look like? Yeah, not speaking in such kind of abstract terms, but who actually are these individuals? Like, how are they living their lives? What does that look like? What are they kind of facing? And not, yeah, I think we're being forced to just not make assumptions that I think we made for a long time, just took for granted. Okay, I like yeah. that. I like that a lot. Um, no, no, uh, no pressing questions in my chat window yet. I'm really, I know, uh, I want to hear from other people. I want to hear from some, from some other folks here. <laughs> um, can other people talk? So yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can unmute some folks, but we've got, we've got a bunch of people on the line here. So I don't, we'll all of a sudden we'll get a, a cacophony of voices. Um, so if we get, if we get uh, a question in the chat window, uh, I can bring you into the conversation. Um, I've got one that came in. Do you have any advice or recommendations for the yeah. gallery sector right now, um, for people who are working in the private sector of the arts about, uh, you know, con being able to continue their, their, their operations? I mean, you, you, yeah. you understand this field, not just from the nonprofit side, but what it means for the markets too. Um, yeah. Is there anything you've seen or do you have any, any ways of thinking about how people can engage with their, their collectors and their artists and keep things flowing? Yeah, my gut, I, I had a long conversation about this last week with a colleague who came to land and said, hey, you know, I, I know I have friends, artists that are really struggling just to pay their rent. Could we do some kind of a fundraiser or benefit in partnership with land that is like a rent fundraiser where artists contribute works that are equivalent to however much rent they need to raise and we'll do some kind of a digital fundraiser. And I was like, I love that idea. We have to think about how land as a nonprofit can pass through funds and all of that um, kind of logistically. But it was interesting then in talking to a couple of other artists and asking them if they would want to participate, what they thought about this idea. And they were like, but don't collectors already know that they're paying artists rents like inherently? And I was like, no, I don't think that that is a conversation that people have kind of top of mind. And so again, I think it's just forcing us to all have a lot more transparency in the language that we use around, again, what we do, why we do what we do and how we do that and like why these things are significant and the real kind of tangible ways that buying a work of art from a gallery isn't just so that that person then gets to live with that work of art and exist in this kind of world that we exist in, but that you're actually paying for this artist to exist in this city that we love and how, again, interconnected these networks all really are and really reinforcing that kind of direct contribution and relationship between you know the sale the purchase of a work of art and allowing someone to pay their rent 
in a, in a time where they might not otherwise. And so I would love to see more galleries just, I don't know what that will look like and if, you know, galleries and I think typically in the kind of art market is a very opaque um, industry, but I would love to see kind of more frank and transparency kind of across the board in terms of like why every single part and role that we all play in this is equally important and the sales piece is a huge part of that. And so we have to just, yeah, have more transparency around those conversations as to why people should continue to be supporting and buying right now. Um, that you're, it's not just to participate in this, that it's, it's directly to like continue and allow artists to survive. Right. It's almost, you were, what you were saying, it sort of popped into my head that, that a gallery could introduce almost a, a membership fee, like, a, like, a, a, like a, a baseline membership fee for their collectors before they're able to buy into individual works. And that membership fee combined with all of the others for the various different clients would go to pay for artists sort of basic necessities, right? When we're talking about, you know, it's like- a gallery this, 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 is this like a new Yeah, was, in, a, in a way, right? I mean, if you think about it, it's like, it becomes a, it becomes a sort of burden sharing. And so it's like, cause I mean, it's like, you know, galleries are often operating this way anyhow, right? It's like that, that there's a kind of, there's a community that you have to gain access to. You have to demonstrate your commitment to the artist and the project. There's a, you know, there's this dance that goes on. And um, I, it would be very interesting to see if, you know, if, if someone could get away with this to say that like, listen, this is, this is what you, the reason why we charge this is because this takes care of a bunch of our overhead and our artists overhead allows everybody to kind of make sure that they're being sustained, you know, even when sales aren't happening. Um, and then, and then the work on top of that then uh, makes it a, its own specific thing. Um, and you could, you could see it, you could see if that, if you could see if that could fly if you were a gallery um, and, and create that, 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 that layer of sort of economic sustainability at the bottom um, in order to get the basics taken care of. We have to, we have to, I mean, this is the larger conversations around just patronage and philanthropy and how that really has to evolve and we have to be open to new ways of educating and supporting our patrons to like do the most kind of direct and meaningful work that they can like the resources are there there the people are there the passions are there but we have to do a better job on the i think the nonprofit side in connecting the dots yeah making those cases stronger yeah so alma writes in with a, a very pointed question does, does the board have a plan to protect the staff's livelihoods in this case yeah, absolutely. Especially, I mean, I had to have, we had a board meeting last week and I had to have a really just direct conversation around, okay, if we're postponing this fundraiser, what does that look like? And when I came back to land last July, we had a whole, a really difficult, not necessarily difficult, but just again, a really frank and direct conversation around board capacity and board giving and expectations. And we upped our board expectation of giving. Um, and that was a really important decision that I wanted to make right off the bat. Like I needed to know that as the director of a small nonprofit, I had a board that had the capacity and understanding also, I think of their response, their fiduciary responsibility to the organization. So yeah, absolutely. Yes. And yes. And I'm so grateful right. that I do, but that was something that was really important to me to kind of establish from the outset. Yeah. You know, in, in a kind of a, uh, as a follow-up to that, I, this is, this is more of a kind of, management study question, but I'd be curious to know at what scale of organization and what scale of board those conversations become more and more difficult to have. I think that at a certain scale, uh, the those asks and those commitments are commitments to people, all of whom you can kind of see in a room and know that that livelihoods depend on it. Um, at what at what size both from the both from the uh, from the board standpoint and the organizational standpoint, does it become so abstract that what people are end up looking at is a balance sheet and it's yeah. less looking at li looking at people? Um, I, yeah, and I think honestly that's also a big reason in terms of why I've been having this desire to kind of share the stories of our staff and how they're getting through right now to really like under to really you know emphasize that these are individuals, these are people's livelihoods that are doing this work. This isn't just oh, land is an idea in a public art organization. No, it's, it, we're made up of a group of 10 people that are committed to doing this work and like how they're doing, what they're doing and the direct correlation between our board and our supporters in terms of supporting those individuals 
livelihoods, yeah. which make up this city, like the ability to have thriving organizations and museums is contingent on a whole class of people that are working for those institutions. And we need to have that kind of direct correlation of support on, from our boards, from our donors, foundations, you know, on all levels. Yeah. Um, another question that, that, that is on the board here is if there are any new, new trends in giving to large and, and uh, small organizations uh, from foundations or individual donors. Uh, the example saying that there are foundations that have been reaching out directly to institutions to offer these contributions. Have you, have you seen that specifically in Los Angeles recently? No, that's what I was saying where I, I really haven't seen that in LA and those are the conversations that I've been having with foundations and I know in speaking with the hammer yesterday that they're having it as well on a kind of larger civic level too. So I think, I think that LA is just a little bit behind some of the other cities like San Francisco and New York in terms of trying to figure out the scope of the effects of this right. um, as right. well as and how we should respond. But I think that we will, I, I, I'm hopeful and just based on the conversations I'm having, I think that we will see more of that over the next Yeah, that's part, that's part of that strange temporality, right? Where now we talk about various different regions and cities being a few days or a few weeks behind other cities in the in the impacts of the of the pandemic, which again is a kind of strange thing to be thinking about. Um, yeah, I mean I, that the uh, you know the, as that question made me also think about and maybe you have an opinion on this. You know, there's a there's a there, one of the arguments for the kind of heavily privatized uh, arts and cultural nonprofit sector and the nonprofit sector in general in the United States. And when I say privatized, I mean that that the majority of the support comes from private individuals and foundations and not from the from the government and the states and the agencies. Um, is a kind of argument for the dynamism, right? Is an argument for like allowing sort of any any form of creativity, activity, political or otherwise, to kind of find its community, find its very, you know, find its mission and its support, and to to really uh, be robust along those lines. This seems to be one of those situations where we're seeing a a challenge, the fundamental challenge, because you know now it's like okay, this is basically how good you've been able to build your own network. Right, and how many yeah. contacts you have with foundations, individual donors, or other grant makers, or other people who are in positions to be able to support, and so it's really become your as a as a as a as the leader of an organization, you know, up to you and your sort of individual capacity to make these things happen. Whereas in a in a funding environment where some significant portion comes from the state. And if the state is basically minting money in order to provide bailouts for all these various different industries and all these different sectors, well, then the arts and cultural sector could rely on, you know, a big chunk of its operating budget still being subsidized by the state, even when all the workers have to go home. Um, this, I mean, I don't, I don't see us heading that direction um, in the United States, but it, it, I think it is a very interesting uh, moment uh, to show where you know, what, what the, the quote unquote dynamism of the, of the U.S. philanthropic model, where it falls through. Um, and as with all, all things like in the healthcare system, it really falls through when there's a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting. And again, I just, I think it is on, you know, the backs of the, the larger foundations to really set the kind of tone and precedence for everyone else to then kind of follow and, I mean, that's a whole other conversation around that, and especially as it pertains to the kind of philanthropic landscape in Los Angeles. But I do think that it is the responsibility of the leaders of the nonprofits to kind of advocate for each other, um, really like emphasize and educate our individual kind of donors and board members in terms of like what this means, not just for our individual organizations, but how it affects everybody and how we can all kind of, you know, raise the bar, if you will, um, and, and really, encourage the supporters that we have to give not just to our organizations but to those and how we can then share those resources you know amongst and collaborate in a way that i think we not we haven't necessarily across within the nonprofits you know locally right how we can so one each other. one final question comes in under the wire we've just got a couple minutes left so um, do you think that this will change the way the social media landscape um, uh, uh, is, is sort of taking shape and, and initiate a, a more kind of informal, transparent, personal messaging the way that we've all sort of begun? Or do you think that we'll snap back to some of the, um, I don't know how to, 
the, the less yeah. authentic, more crafted. Uh, <laughs> that's my, that's that we're my used to. I think my gut response says, yes, this will be a kind of larger shift to a more, let's call it authentic, informal, transparent. I think transparency is like really the key term. Like it just, this isn't the time for the kind of like pre-packaged canned responses and like, oh my God, how bizarre is it? I don't know if you've been seeing, but like now when you watch Netflix or on, I was watching HBO the other night, all of these like really strangely polished ads for like coronavirus prevention and COVID-19, it's bizarre. I haven't seen, I haven't seen any of this. It's really, really strange and yeah. a bizarre, whole new. It hits whole the wrong time. Um, yeah. So all that to say, <laughs> I, I think so. I, I hope so. I know in terms of land and our organization and our platforms, that's the direction that we're moving just out of necessity. Like, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Laura, thank you thank so you, much for uh, taking part in this conversation. Thank you everyone for joining yeah. us. Um, and uh, join us on Thursday. We will be announcing the next, the next contestant soon. Um, and we'll be doing this more and more. So again, I can't, I can't thank you enough. Best of luck, Laura. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye, guys. All right, bye, Laura. Thanks, everyone.